The vernacular poetic output of the Brazilian colonial period displays a subversive engagement with the legacies of antiquity adopted by Iberian poets and setting foundations for the national Brazilian literature, which fully formed after Brazil's independence in 1822. In colonial and post-colonial contexts, literary manipulation of classical antiquity provided the stage for debate on issues of contemporary relevance, such as the status of the indigene and the cost of empire. My presentation this afternoon seeks to consider the manipulation of the space and displacements of antiquity in the poetry of one of the poets working under such conditions, the Brazilian Claudio Manuel da Costa, by means of a reading of the text contained in the collected work, The Obras, published in 1768 of this Brazilian poet and statesman. I will focus on the conception of Arcadia as a fictive space, displacement in the metaphor of exile and transformation as a critical stage upon which to consider the colonized condition. These topics will be shown to be grounded in an avidian poetics of space as fundamental to thinking about empire. Under lived conditions of imperialist expansion, how does the imagined landscape, the landscape of poetry, offer a kind of refuge for the subaltern and colonized mind? And how can the image of exile encapsulate the experience of living between colony and metropole? Though da Costa is relatively unknown among Anglophone classicists, my work today is especially indebted to the work of scholars of Brazilian literature in Brazil, such as the seminal studies of Sergio Alcides and Sergio Buarque de Holanda, and more recently in the work of Carlos Berciani de Zanjus, and especially those analyses of the poet that understand him to be an exile in his own land, as Lauda Melody Souza formulates in her 2011 biography of the poet. All of this material will be referenced in a bibliography that is the final slide of the presentation. Before looking at his text, I will start with an overview of the literary context. A new classical literary aesthetic style emerged in colonial Brazil in the second half of the 18th century as a reaction against the European Baroque, which was criticized as overly ornamental and indulgent, and in anticipation of the pathos of the Romantic period, the signature imagery of which was, in Brazil at least, the idealized Tupi Guarani indigene and the distinctive landscapes of the Atlantic forest. Poets of the period sought a return to the aesthetic simplicity of Greco-Roman pastoral poetry, adopting bucolic pseudonyms and the personae of shepherds, pastores in the Portuguese, composing simple strains in harmony with rural nature. Six poets are especially highlighted as exceptional from this time period in the Brazilian literary histories of the 1960s and 1970s, those of such figures as Cangido and Coutinho. The overall production of this period is certainly not limited to these six, as indicated by the attested pseudonyms and literary corpora of various other such poets available in anthologies and other testimonia. The literary movement was called Arcadianism, Arcadismo in the Portuguese, and its poets Arcadians. And since many of them were from the state of Minas Gerais, located in the southern region of the country, these came to be known collectively by Brazilian literary historians as the school of Minas, I Scala Mineira. Minas Gerais was the location, additionally it should be noted, of a failed insurrection movement, the Inconfidencia Mineira, in which poets including Da Costa, Alvarenga Pichotu, and Gonzaga were involved, all starred here on the, on the slide. Many of these poets had been educated in the classical tradition in the Jesuit schools in Brazil, especially Rio de Janeiro, and at European institutions of higher learning, such as the University of Coimbra in Portugal. Da Costa is one such poet with precisely this biography. And it is this tension between the European cultural environment and its home of Brazil that will be critical to the analysis that follows. These poets composed and circulated their poetry as part of a learned literary academy based in Brazil, the Arcadia Ultramarina, from which the literary movement gets its name, Arcadianism. This literary academy, the Arcadia Ultramarina, was a transatlantic branch of the Roman Academia del Arcadi, where most notably one member, the Brazilian José Basilio da Gama, had been enrolled while spending time in Rome. Joaquim Inácio de Seixas Brandão and Domingos Caldas Barbosa are the other Brazilians who have been confirmed 
by archival documentation as members of the Roman Academy as well. The formality of this group, the requirements, if any, for membership, the degree to which a network existed among them, the details and the logistics of its activities is difficult to reconstruct and much still remains unknown. A crucial artifact to the reconstruction of the ac activity of the Arcadia Ultramarina and its formal affiliation to the Roman Academia delle Arcadi was recovered in the 1990s by José Mindlin, a Brazilian bibliophile, which put an end to the debates around the accurate reconstructions of this period. The document in question is the diploma of one Brazilian member, Joaquim Minasso de Seixas Brandão, attesting to his enrollment in the Roman Academy and uh, where he was bestowed with the bucolic pseudonym Driazio Edimanteo, as was the practice for all admitted members. The document attests to his enrollment in the Academy delle Arcadi in Rome on the recommendation of two members referred to by the pseudonym Serlin du Sepiliu, which is the pseudonym of the Brazilian Josep Basile da Gama, and Fililu Vipareo, a Roman named Enrico Turner. Crucially for the historical record, included at the bottom of the page of this document was a brief mandate indicating the foundation of a Brazilian branch of the Academy. We see here the phrase, per la fondazione della colonia ultramarina, for the foundation of a colony across the sea. Interpretations of this document and a supplementary text, an ode written by Satius Brandel with the title Ode to a Roman Arcadian who was to establish a new Arcadia in Brazil, first published by Manuel Rodriguez Lapa in 1969, allow for a reconstruction of a genealogy that attributes the initial task of the foundation of the Arcadia Ultramarina to the Brazilian Basilio da Gama. This is envisioned through the metaphor, it should be noted, of literary and cultural colonization devised between a colony set across the Atlantic as indicated by Ultramarina, whose figural center was Rome as imperial and cultural metropole. The earliest literary testimony of the Brazilian branch of the Academy and the poetic production of its members can be traced to the publication of the collected poetry, the Obra, literally in the Portuguese, the works of Claudio Manuel da Costa in 1768. The, poem on the, uh, the poet on the dedication page identifies himself as an Articagi Ultramarino working under the pseudonym Glossestri Saturnio what has long been marked by Brazilian literary historians as the signature incipit of Brazilian Arcadianism. It is a sprawling collection of poems containing a vast array of texts of varying genres, whose gravitational center is oriented in the Greco-Roman bucolic while containing vestiges of the European Baroque style quickly falling out of fashion. The collection consists of 104 stanza sonnets, of which 14 were written in Italian, added late to the collection, three episegios, a kind of uh, eulogizing epitaph poem for a deceased figure, 20 eclogues, which of all the collection most closely adhere to the style of Virgilian eclogues, six letters, epistulas, sent between fictitious shepherds, so Alcino to Soleno, Galizo to Salicio, for example, four of a type of narrative poem termed a romance, a handful of canzonettas and cantatas, also in Italian, and its centerpiece, the myth of the stream of Carmo, in which the poet gives an ideological account of the eponymous river near his native home, the city of Mariana, as the transformed body of a shepherd punished by the god Apollo for a transgressive passion of a maiden named Yelena. Included with the collection of poems are paratextual documents in which the poet makes clear his intentions for his text and clarifies the circumstances of its production with autobiographical details. Critically, he orients the poems in relation to an audience and a prologue to the reader and speaks directly to various dedicatees. In every case, these consisted of Portuguese statesmen sent from the metropole to Brazil to take up positions of governance over the districts of the colony and under whose social patronage the Costa lived and worked. Today I'll be focusing especially on this material and reading it in dialogue with the poetic material that follows. 
The setting of Da Costa's poetry is overdetermined by the Greco-Roman bucolic tradition and its reception in Italian Arcadianism, emblematized by Jacopo Sanazzaro, that Da Costa inherited as a member of the aesthetic school to which he belonged. By and large, the poet demonstrates a clear thematic adherence to the fictional space of Arcadia as a foundational principle of his text. An idyllic landscape determined as the fictive space of Arcadia serves as a pleasant backdrop for a cast of ancient literary figures among whom contemporary poets and figures such as Acosta could insert themselves in the voice of poetic personae. As in Virgil's Eclogues, the literary world of Acosta's sonnets, eclogues, and letters is populated with shepherds who tended to their flocks, seeking refuge from the heat of the sun in the shade of trees growing at the banks of placid streams and who whiled away idle hours composing songs, either in isolation or in dialogue with one another. An especially visible motif transferred from the European traditions of pastoralism is the pathetic fallacy of the landscape that sympathizes with the lamenting and heartbroken shepherd mirroring his condition and physical degradation. This is a topos most famously articulated in the description of the death of Gallus in Virgil's Eclogue 10, and then in the Greek model of the Theocracy and Daphnis in antiquity. The poet is especially explicit in signaling that the world of his shepherds is particularly that of Virgil's Eclogues in the first two stanzas of his third epistola, the letter written from the shepherd Deliso to Cilicio, in which letter he evokes Virgil's shepherd Titerus and the object of his desire, Amaryllis, by name. To you, beloved shepherd, who there from the country's river, on the refreshing shores, the watery streams, just like beneath the shady poplar tree, Titerus, who burned by Amaryllis, sighed for her, wild away the agreeable hours in the composition of verse, whether your fate be propitious or unpropitious, to you, Deliso wishes good health and placid rest. He, the sad shepherd, uh, et cetera, et cetera. The allusion is marked especially meta-receptively here by the use of the simile to distinguish between the reference and its frame. The bucolic world with which the shepherds interact takes on an air of the unreal space of Arcadia in the frequent discussion of the nymphs who approach the shepherds to hear their songs and the muses who inspire them, often anchored to the landscape as the spirits of the natural features, the mountains and rivers, which make up the scenery. The fictive and the imaginary available to Arcadian pastoralism, replete with fawns and dryads setting the scene, set the space of Da Costa's literary landscape in the realm of the unreal and aspatial. This grounding in the spaces and personae of Arcadia is destabilized by the malleability of the projected landscape, which simultaneously holds in its view Rome, Portugal, and colonial America. Following the title page of the Obras, Da Costa includes among the prefatory material to the collected works a citation of two Latin verses of Virgil's Georgics. I will be the first to bring the muses with thee into my country so long as life remains, returning from the Ionian peak. The verses affect a projection of landscape that transfers Virgil's realm onto da Costa's native Brazil that mediates between two distinct poles, taking advantage of the semiotic malleability of the deictic terms ego in patriam mecum. The pottery of the quotation, devoid of fixed meaning when decontextualized, is entirely determined by a contextual referent as a floating signifier inviting varying interpretations of the term. For Virgil, these poles are Greece and Rome, his patria. For Da Costa, these are Europe and Brazil as colony and metropole, in addition to Roman antiquity and his contemporary time and space. The transference which Da Costa affects thus runs parallel to that which Virgil himself has already accomplished when Virgil transfers the muses from their seat in Aeonia to Rome. The Virgilian transference of the seat of poetic inspiration from Greece to Rome thus takes on a meta-receptive valence in the context of the transference of European literary aesthetics to colonial America.
A question is posed to be explored in the sonnets and other kinds of poems that follow of locating da Costa geographically, which patria is it that we're talking about? A question whose very posing results in a destabilization that manifests as a disorientation in space. The prologue to the reader, penned by da Costa and included in the prefatory material, the Abra, makes clear that despite his self-assertions as an Arcadian and the overwhelming localization of his textual production as set in Arcadia, his home of Brazil is not in fact the blessed Arcadia of the classical imagination. And the poetry produced within it is poised tensely within, but also beyond this fictive world. The afflicted condition of the poet between the metropole and colony is figured in the loss of poetic inspiration mediated through the antique figuration of muses local and specific to region. The fictive space of Arcadia is denied in the world of the poet quite explicitly. These are not the blessed beaches of Arcadia where the sound of the waters inspired the harmony of poetic verse, muddy and ugly is the flow of these dreams that first deprive the poet of his ideas and leave him to contemplate the ambitious fatigue of mining this land which has perverted its colors. The prologue here offers a brief condemnation of European imperial expansion into Brazil by means of an eco-critical assessment of the effects of the gold and silver mining by Europeans that resulted in the degradation of his natural environment and its ruination as a potential source of poetic inspiration. A contrast is established be between the clear crystal waters of Portugal's famous Mondego, Lima, and Tagus rivers as sources of bucolic and poetic inspiration, the Greco-Roman poetic landscape of Arcadia, and the regions of colonial Brazil, whose streams have been altered by human intervention. The poetic innervation of this, described in this prologue, points to the inability of the European model of ecological poetic inspiration to produce an American colonial poetry. Da Costa abandons the pretended nymphs of the rivers in favor of a different theme, the precious metals extracted from the mines. This lack of poetic inspiration is ameliorated and supplanted by what the poet here calls a great passion for my native home, out of which he claims to have composed the centerpiece of the work, the myth of the stream of Carmo. In light of such a critique, the voice of the shepherd of the bucolic material contained in the Albrecht becomes a disembodied and displaced voice in search of a landscape and finding some refuge in the imagined landscape of poetry. And in an, in an apologetic poetic production distinct to his homeland that denies the suitability of a European model of poetic inspiration to the colonized spaces of the Americas. While the bucolic Virgil is in many ways foregrounded as the primary model for the texts themselves, Ovid in fact emerges as the poetic model with whom da Costa most readily identifies in the paratextual materials in which he comments on his own poetic production. Ovid is identified in such materials as the Roman poet in his condition writing from exile. The biographical trajectory of this, of this poet moving between Rome and Tomis and speaking back to Augustus on whose mercy or cruelty Ovid's condition was contingent, serves as the frame for the activities of da Costa writing in a Portuguese literary ambit from Brazil and whose lived condition was subject to Portuguese generals and governors in positions of power in Portuguese America. Da Costa's positioning for whom the education in European centers of learning seems to have been formative frames him as a stranger in a foreign land, even when he is returning to his home in Brazil, a home which he understands as his origins, but still subject to the effects of colonization and the demands of the metropole. The poet recognizes himself as the cultural product of the metropole, but with an intimate identification with the colony as, quote, the cradle in which I was born, as he tells us in the first stanza of Sonnet 98 in the Abra. The dedication, which follows the title page of the Abra, introduces the Roman poet quite explicitly and presents its dedicatee, the Portuguese José Luís Jiménez de Zabranche Castelo Branco, the Count of Valadares and recently appointed Captain General of Minas Gerais, as a poetic patron like the Roman patron Mycenas. The opening of the dedication presents an obsequious flattery of the Count 
in which the poet implicitly identifies himself with Ovid, here described with reference to his birthplace as the Fulmonian, Fulmonensi. The opening words of this dedication contain bilingual intertexts first identified by Helio Lopez in 1997 that recall the first poem of Ovid's Tristia. And I've marked them, the cognates, the bilingual cognates on the slide in bold. Mordacidaci with Mordebere, Patrocinio with Patrocinio, Causa with Causa, and I've added a few more myself, Inuce, and Inutil, Ostiosidaci as equivalent to Latin Otia. Da Costa has projected his work, biography, and the conditions of the production of his poetry onto the autobiographical details of the Roman poet's life and exile as presented in the Tristia, the first of all of its texts to thematize alienation and poetic production. In the prologue to the reader that follows this dedication, once again, Ovid is foregrounded as the poetic model who is most relevant for him. And again, and again, a poet working in the condition of exile. Da Costa conjures the image of the displaced poet bridging the divide between Rome and Tomis and calling upon his poetry to speak for him. If your malice is not over much, you must certainly admit that some thanks are owed to the talents of the poet who from the mountain ranges of the district of Minas Gerais aspires to give you the meager offering of these albedas. I recognize that only among the delights of the Pindus Mountains can the spirits be nourished, which are destined from birth to speak of the muses. And perhaps in such certainty, the poet banished from his land imagined that the Cycladic islands of the Aegean Sea had marveled that he should be able to compose poetry from among the terrors of the violently fluctuating waves. The sense of place as the Mediterranean is emphasized in the abundance of geographic details given, the Pindus Mountains, especially as the source of inspiration for the poets of antiquity, the Cycladic Islands, and the Aegean Sea. Nonetheless, the sense of displacement is vivid in this anecdotic detail of the violently fluctuating waves, the Portuguese term Gista Haddu deprived of his land, all of which serves as a shorthand for the broader narrative of the rough and unfortunate journey of the Roman poet into exile. Certainly this journey is more subtly available as a parallel to the journey by which da Costa traveled across the Atlantic between Portugal and Brazil for his studies at the University of Coimbra and upon his return. It is a vignette that is taken directly from Ovid's own autobiographical poetic content in Tristia 111, the first 10 verses. Whatever letter has been read by you in this whole little book, Ovid tells us, was written during the duration of my troubled journey. Either the Adriatic Sea saw me writing them in the middle of its waters as I trembled in the chilly month of December, or after we had passed in our course the Isthmus with its two seas and the second ship of my flight had been taken up, I think that the Aegean Cyclades were struck in wonder that I could write verses among the wild roaring of the sea. I myself even now marvel that my talent did not fall inert in such great waves of spirit and sea. The act of the Roman poet in marveling here with the Latin term mirror at his own ability to produce poetry in exile has been transferred in the equivalent Portuguese cognate Chiam Ajmeradzu, which I have bolded here to the Cyclades themselves, essentially equivalent to what Ovid describes with the Latin term Obstipuissa. A motif of poetic failure pervades the exilic poetry reiterated in the persistent motif of the enervation caused by his new surroundings, an enervation vividly discussed in Da Costa's prologue in passages we have already seen. The vast expanse that lies between Ovid and Rome serves as a template in Da Costa's prologue for the vast expanse that lies between Da Costa and Europe from the vantage point of Minas Gerais. Da Costa's orientation in Brazil is made explicit in the opening line when the poet describes himself writing from the mountain ranges of the district of Minas Gerais. The term desgi in the Portuguese having a forceful relational and geographical valence. Such framing put into this prologue orients the poet thematically in relation to an audience that is perpetually distant from him that must always be addressed from a vast expanse. 
Another citation brings into play Ovid's exile poetry, again, aligning the cluster to Ovid in exile and enlisting his poetic material in the task of ingratiating him to an imperial center to which he speaks from a position as an outsider. A quotation of Ovid's exile poetry is included in the lengthy dedication that serves as a prolegomenon to the third of Da Costa's eclogues contained in the Obras, in which Da Costa quietly frames the Portuguese minister who is the dedicatee as the Roman Augustus besieged by Ovid in exile. A lengthy dedication precedes the text of the third eclogue uh, written for Sebastião José de Carvalho e Melo, the Count of Oedas and first minister of Portugal, the famous Pombal, in honor of his pacification of war, a pacificação da guerra. As part of the dedication, there is a brief citation of Ovid identified as a verse from the Tristia, Yuxta ilud Ovid tris si poteris vaclo tradi, just as that which Ovid says in the Tristia, if you could be handed over to him when he is at leisure. The Latin quotation si poteris vaclo tradi is taken from Tristia 1 1 verse 93. The broader context of Tristia 1 1 imagines the book of Ovid's poetry returning to Rome and seeking the court of Augustus where it hopes to be received favorably and to win over the forgiveness of the poet in exile, ensuring his return. The brief quotation of Da Costa of this passage as a dedication of the eclogue to its patron likens Da Costa once again to the poet in the condition of exile and brings his poetry in service of winning for himself clemency from its recipient when we consider the fuller, more original context of the Tristia 1-1. Da Costa's poetry implicitly likened to the text of Ovid's corpus that the poet sends to Rome to speak on his behalf enjoys a freedom of movement and boundary crossing that sets it in stark relief to the condition of the poet restricted geographically to his confinement. When viewed in its fullest context, the quotation perhaps also subtly suggests an antagonistic relationship between the poet and patron, and perhaps an indictment of the cruelty of its recipient whose anger and temper may elicit further punishment for the poet. The closing image of this dedication reflects on the poet's condition, writing to his patron as follows. I come from the mountains. I live in rustic lack of cultivation. I speak of rusticity. It is not much that everything that I conceive is dissonance and everything I utter is barbarism. May your excellency give ear to my intention and may you not take offense at my gift. The focus on language and place and the use of the term barbarism resonates with Ovidian claims in the Tristia to be altered in language and intelligibility by his exile. Ovid reverses the valence of the term barbaric in his inability to establish connection because of a failure of language to the getai who surround him at Tristia 510 verses 37 to 38. Barbarous hic ego sum. Here I am the barbarian, I who am not understood by anyone and the Getai stupidly laugh at my Latin words. Similarly, at Tristia 3, 1, 17 to 20, Ovid laments the change of language of his poetry, claiming in the voice of the poetry that speaks on its own behalf, that after spending so much time away from Rome in a barbaric country, Barbara Terra Fuit, that his language is no longer recognizable as Latin. If anything by chance will seem to not have been spoken in Latin, the land in which it was written was a foreign one, Barbara. Say readers, if not too burdensome, where I ought to go, what home I should seek out as a book that is a guest in this city, the city of Rome. Ovid's use of the term barbarous in both of these examples plays on the folk etymology of the term that tracks foreignness to use of language. We see the same play in the phrase I've highlighted here in Da Costa's usage, everything I utter is barbarism. Unusual here is the fact that Da Costa and his dedicatee both speak Portuguese. And yet in place of what we might expect to be mutual intelligibility is a fear of a lack of understanding, a metaphorical distance between poet and reader tracked across language. 
As in the case of Ovid's exilic poetry then, the writings of the poet are missives that are made to traverse a geography whose alienation can never truly be resolved and whose audience is persistently distanced from the author. His book of poetry has been composed, the poet reiterates for his reader in the prologue, for the most part in Coimbra in Portugal, and a little bit later to use the poet's own words. What he means by this is after he had returned to Brazil. The manuscript would make its way back to Portugal to be published in Coimbra by the Oficina de Luís Seco Ferreira after being subject to a process of review and censorship by the Portuguese Real Mesa Sensoria, an appendage of the monarchy. A persistent theme of the Tristia is the narrativization of the return of Ovid's book to Rome while the poet remains in exile. And this is quite suggestive as a theme for da Costa's work, given the circumstances of its publication and its negotiation of a space framed as exilic. Understanding the text of the Albertus as a text of Ovidian exile, the misprint of its intended title displayed on the title page of the first published edition was consequently quite serendipitous. In, in place of obras, meaning simply works, the title was misprinted as orbas, the transposition of letters that resulted in a word which is nonsensical in Portuguese. However, the misprint by its approximation to the Latin qualifier orbus makes available a reading of the title of the text as indicating that it is bereft of its author. Ovid imagined his books in exile to be bereft of their parent, calling them Orba Perentes Duo Volumina in Tristia 1735, and again Orba Parenta at Tristia 314, verse 15. In both cases of Ovid's Tristia, the exiled poet acknowledges the capabilities of the poetry as being distinct from the poet who produced them. In each case, the poetry is able to enter the city of Rome, a city barred to the poet in exile. Considering such a framing of his poetry reinforces the position of da Costa as dislocated from Brazil, uh, from Portugal, I'm sorry, and understands his poetry published in Portugal as making a journey on his behalf to speak to an audience from a position of supplication, an audience who is potentially hostile to him and to his work. The exile suffered by da Costa is thus manifold, reflecting the poet's external conditions, finding himself in the colonial state of Brazil, altered through European interventions that disfigured the landscape and away from the cultural traditions and centers of Europe and for which European models of poetic inspiration were not fitting. It is simultaneously a displacement from the literary world of Arcadia and the European literary tradition, which came to signify in the Italian Renaissance. The model of the exilic poetry activates a poetic style that thematizes geographic wonder, the confrontation between Ovid and the strangeness and newness of his new home and its people and an ethnographic exploration. Applied to the condition of the Costa returning to Brazil from Portugal, what the Costa ultimately describes as this experience of disorientation and enervation occurs not from a far off place entirely foreign to him, but from the very country in which he was born and with which he ultimately felt himself as aligned, as various scholars have put it, an exile in his own land. Such a reading of the landscapes in the Obras perhaps invites the reader to a reappraisal of the significance of the theme of Ovidian transformation to the text of the Obras, with which I will here conclude. Ovid's Metamorphoses was an essential model for stories of transformation in the Baroque period, especially. The influence of this text can be seen throughout the Obras, but especially in its centerpiece, the myth of the stream of Carmo, the transformation of the stream near his hometown. I present for consideration, not that text, but the seventh sonnet from the collection of sonnets that activates the Baroque and Ovidian theme of transformation but here in service of a disorientation of space, as the, the sonnet reads as follows, where am I? I don't recognize this place. Who made that meadow so different? Everything has taken on a new nature. And as I reflect on it, timid, 
I wither. Here there was a spring. I don't forget that once I lay reclining beside it, there into a valley, into a, valley a, ma a mountain has been transformed. How much can the march of years accomplish? I saw trees here so flowering, which made the spring perpetual. Now I see not even trees in decay. I am mistaken, this wasn't the place, but I come to marvel when my troubles are present, how everything degenerates along with it. We see this similar themes of transformation hinted in the Tristia as well, if we look very closely for references to the metamorphoses, I include one such reference here from Ovid Tristia 1, 1, 117 to 20. Ovid describes his library back in Rome, the library to which his Tristia should approach, giving an account of the books that are there, including the metamorphoses. There are also the 15 volumes of changed forms, poems recently snatched from my funeral pyre, to this I bid you say that among their changed bodies could the image of my misfortune be included. Ovid becomes a metamorpho, uh, metamorphosed subject for the very text that he has already written. When da Costa returned from Portugal to Brazil, he found his home transformed by the ambitious fatigue of the gold and silver mining of the Europeans, a transformation which caused his feeling of exile in his homeland. When da Costa returned to Brazil, he found it transformed and found himself transformed as well into a stranger in a strange land. Thank you all so much for your attention.